you all for joining us today. Um, I'm excited to engage in this conversation and hope you all will just raise your hands and interject at any point so that it's not just a conversation between the two of us. Um, so welcome, Pam Cantor. Um, you know, there's probably no issue more you know, salient to the work that goes on at Teach for America and across the Teach for All network um, than just the issues of, you know, sort of how violence and trauma and just the additional challenges of poverty sort of impact the effort to think about how do we provide kids with the kind of education that enables them to, you know, sort of truly, you know, overcome all of that and access you know, the full range of options. So um, we're excited and just lucky to have a true expert in these questions um, with us today. Um, Pam is the founder, president and CEO of Turnaround for Children, um, but also just brings a long history prior to that um, uh, as a practicing child psychiatrist for 18 years. Um, and you could do this better than I, but she spent much of her career on the escalation of community and school violence and its effects. Uh, worked with the Department of Justice on the Children Exposed to Violence Initiative, which developed an action plan for statewide implementation of prevention, intervention, and accountability programs throughout the con country, uh, and was also the co-director of the Eastern European Child Abuse and Child Mental Health Project, which trained professionals in 12 countries uh, in best mental health practices. Um, so, before we get started, I also want to remind all those folks online out there that you can ask questions by using Yammer or Twitter, uh, and just use the hashtag Pam Canner, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so, um, so Pam, can, can you start by telling us how you got involved in, in the turnaround, you know, work uh, in the wake of 9-11, of maybe, as a way to just get us, get us started? Sure. Because of the background that I have in trauma and the effects of trauma on kids, when 9-11 happened in New York, uh, Deputy Chancellor Judy Rizzo contacted me um, because they were trying to figure out how in a city with 1.4 million kids, many of whom were going to be affected by 9-11, how could you imagine getting help to kids? and what was the role of schools in providing that help. So it was, a, it was a, tremendous, a tremendously interesting period. And I, I just want to tell you two or three insights from that period because they relate very much to the period that we're in. So 1.4 million kids. And when we did a large epidemiologic study of that system, we found that the kids that were most affected by 9-11 were not in ground zero. They were in the communities of deepest poverty. So the kids that lit up with anxiety symptoms, with other kinds of mental health issues, they weren't the ground zero kids. Second big insight was that ground zero was a middle class community. And the families in ground zero wanted their kids to get help for this problem. But in the communities of deepest poverty, the stigma associated with mental health help was so huge that even though these kids were tremendously affected, it was not possible to break through those barriers without some real thinking about barriers um, and get help to kids. And then there was the enormity of this. It was the sheer numbers of kids who needed help which according to the study that we did with the Mailman School of Public Health, it was one in five kids hmm. in the system. So when you think about the disparity of capacity versus need, when you think about concentration of need in the communities that have the fewest resources, you begin to see the shape of, of the problem and what this means for schools. Hmm. And, so, and so what did that lead you to? Or how did that, yeah, what did you do with that? Well, I'll, I'll tell you about walking into Turnaround's first school, which was an elementary school in Washington Heights um, with 1,100 kids. And this was a community where they had had that other plane crash with the Dominican family. So mm -hmm. there were many, many different kinds of losses and traumas for these kids. And I walked into this school, and the school was dark. 
there was no work on the walls, and there were kids, lar some large kids, running in the halls, fighting with each other, and there was a mother holding the hand of a five-year-old little girl who was bringing her daughter to school. And the thought that went through my head was, I would never leave my child in a place like this. And so, and I was a child psychiatrist. I was an intervention person. And there were 1,100 kids in this school that felt like a war zone. So I think for us, what hit us was that the interventional model, though really important, couldn't be the only tool in your toolbox if you were going to imagine how to meet the level of need in these schools. So the beginning of thinking about turnaround and turnaround's model was to make the entire school a healthy place. Certainly to get services to kids with intense needs, for sure. But if you didn't do something more than that, you were never going to match uh, the level of need in the building. Mm -hmm. And so how does turnaround actually work? Okay. Is that is that an okay next question? I mean, sure. I, I'm dying to explore the mental health questions because I just I think just the disparity in how those issues are addressed from one socioeconomic bracket to another could explain enormous amounts. Um, and I don't know if the turnaround model addresses that directly, but I'm just curious well, why, about that. Why don't I describe the model? Yeah. And I'm going to try to weave in the theory behind each mm -hmm. part of it, because the model Perfect. has evolved over 12 years. The first part of the model, you want to picture that elementary school in Washington <laughs> Heights, and this idea that we had to build a high capacity student support system. So by high capacity, we mean that there needed to be a social worker in the building because a social worker that gets to know the community of a, of a school can be a huge help in resolving stigma issues because the social worker is part of the school community and is typically somebody that the parents trust. So consent and stigma are things that are very much helped by having a trained social worker. The other thing we understood was that you needed to be able to somehow identify and triage kids correctly because otherwise, the kids who made it into the social worker's office were the kids that were disrupting the learning environment for the teachers, not necessarily a child with an emotional issue. So if you were an actor-outer, you ended up in the social worker's office as a default disciplinary measure. Then you have the subject of these interdisciplinary teams needing to learn how to identify correctly understand how to prioritize the needs of kids, look at the whole child, resolve the issues of consent and stigma, and teachers needed a place to present the challenging kids. Mm -hmm. But they also had to be taught how to say something that was the information that the mental health people needed, mm -hmm. not just he's acting out in class. So this became a whole educative process of how to create these interdisciplinary teams that we call student intervention teams. But even then, we felt that's not enough. You've got to have mental health providers in the community providing some capacity as well. But here we found there were other barriers. For instance, the providers in the community are fueled by Medicaid. And Medicaid only pays for a child who is in the seat. The kids that are tearing up a school and are the most actor-outers, they are not going to therapy. Okay, the ones who go to therapy typically are actually the more moderately at-risk kids. So the mental health system wants to serve the moderate-risk kids. It doesn't really want to help the high-risk kids because there are many barriers about that. So Turnaround's first model was to resolve all of these barriers and to turn this into a fluid system that could see lots more kids and give them a kind of care that matched the intensity of their needs. Mm -hmm. When we did this, we got some dramatic effects on culture and climate, just doing that alone, that student support practice. But what we found was the teachers who did not get any training in classroom organization and management, they were still sending kids to the social worker. And so the social worker would, in not too long a time, get loaded up with kids and burn out. 
So that's what drove us to the second part of the model, which was to begin to think about what are the practices that every single teacher needs to have to manage a class successfully and to create a positive culture, a positive learning environment in their classrooms. And we found that when you combined the behavioral practices in teachers with the student support practices, you got even more dramatic mm -hmm. effects on culture and climate. The next. Okay, let me pause. <laughs> okay. Let, let's Sorry. actually just go deep on each of these. Can I go back okay. to the first one? Because sure. I want to make sure Absolutely. I understand it. I think okay. probably everyone got it but me. So I just want to make sure, like, the student support practice, because I just think we need this in every school, what you're articulating. Right. But how does it work now in the, in the turnaround model? Like, how, how do you figure out what kids need the services and, and how, to, how, how do you? What, what is the difference in the turnaround model from the status quo again? Okay, in, in most, if you mean by status quo, what's going on in most schools? Where the like medium need kids are getting the Medicaid and the... In a typical school yeah. today, a high poverty school, low performing, they will typically have a social worker. That social worker will also be seeing the kids who will be seen. Meanwhile, the actor routers are mm -hmm. running around the building and disrupting classes. Yeah. And the mental health providers are also seeing the moderately affected kids by and large. So you contrast that with a picture in a turnaround school where the student intervention team knows who the frequent flyers mm -hmm. are in the building. And that team is dedicated to getting help to those frequent flyers. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can have 100 frequent flyers in a building. And what you have to do to get help to them, you might have to do home visits. You might have to go to the homeless shelter. You have to go and move mountains mm -hmm. to engage families or caregivers in the process of that child getting help. And you have to engage that child. Mm -hmm. All of those things require training, and they require effort. Mm -hmm. but. In every one of our schools, we've learned that if you get help to the most intensely needy kids and you do that as the first thing, mm -hmm. the stress in the building goes down. The numbers of kids who look like they need help go down. The intensity of what they need looks like it goes down mm -hmm. because you have done that piece well. And does the Medicare system pay for that? essentially yes because if yeah. you get a child that's so the money why the, is there the money is there and it's not enough money for these mental health providers okay child yeah. mental health is the least yeah. well reimbursed system that we have but and, and turnaround has figured out a way around that as well to supplement med, um, mental health clinics at the front end mm -hmm. until we get the system running mm -hmm. but as long as they get to this place where there are no no-shows mm -hmm. Medicaid works. Wow. But you have to climb that hill. And so you do that with like private philanthropy or supplementary. Right. Yeah. Everybody gets a supplement until the providers are able to run this in a, in a cost-efficient And can you say way. like what percentage of the kids, like what does that lead, yeah. the shift to, what percentage of the kids then in the new system get mental health services versus in the old? Well, about. in any one of the schools that we've been in, at least 15% of the kids have these really intense needs that yeah. can drive a negative culture in a building. Yeah. The, the circle beyond that circle can get up to 50% 50, 50 of the kids mm -hmm. that are going to need an intervention beyond a typical classroom. Mm -hmm. yeah. That fact has also told us that more has to happen at the classroom level, but you don't mm -hmm. want me to go ahead well, till yeah. that yet. No, so we we'll can, get to we that. Can, and, and I would imagine that once the families get this help, they're just like... Totally. It, we have, we have families sense. coming to schools that don't have their children there anymore yeah. because the school has become such a trusted yeah. place for them. Okay, so part two, helping teachers gain the tools to actually manage a positive classroom culture. Now, what That's are those two. tools? <laughs> There's lots of, no doubt, curiosity in here on that particular okay. topic. Well, you know, we didn't want to invent any of this, so a, a lot of the really wonderful um, R&D type funding that we got mm -hmm. was to look at practices across the country 
So one curriculum that we've extracted material from is classroom organization and management practices, which is out of Vanderbilt mm -hmm. University. Some of those modules we've put together mm -hmm. as a toolkit for, um, for our teachers. Mm -hmm. And the other one we use quite a bit of is based on the work of Jeff Colvin, um, C-O-L-V-I-N. Mm -hmm. And so the two practices on the behavioral side we call classroom rules and procedures, which is all about just setting up a classroom. Mm -hmm. um, but it contains some of the comp practices. And then diffusing disruptive behavior. And that is how do you not get distracted off your lesson plan, but are able to diffuse disruption and cue kids so that they can make a better choice during mm -hmm. class. And those two practices are among, among the most popular things that mm -hmm. we do. Yeah. I mean, there really has been very, very little resistance in bringing mm -hmm. those into schools. Mm -hmm. and, and you've seen them, I take it, have a really positive impact on classroom management practices. Yes, yes. Uh, um. I mean, our experience has been um, in the kinds of schools that we're in, we don't have a lot of TFA type people. Um, we're working with a, a population of teachers that are in more of a been there, done that kind of mentality and are not welcoming necessarily mm -hmm. of, of the work that it takes to change practice. On top of that, we created a delivery system of one hour per week per teacher mm -hmm. in small group and with a lot of self-assessment as a part of it. So there's resistance in the beginning mm -hmm. to doing this and to doing it well. But our saturation rates around proficiency are 75, 85% mm -hmm. uh, of teachers in a building. And our experience has been once they see something work mm -hmm. against a problem that's really yeah. um, difficult, yeah. uh, the motivation goes way up. That's great, okay. Um, let me know if any questions out here. Um, okay, part three. Part three. So with all of, of the development of the model, there was still this notion that was there something that the model didn't have that related to persistent and recurring challenges in high poverty schools? And looked at through that lens, we name the two biggest challenges that we see as disruption of the learning environment, engagement of students. We think that the student support practice and the behavioral uh, stuff with teachers is really good on the disruption of the learning environment. Mm -hmm. But the engagement and motivation of students, this wasn't touching to the mm -hmm. same degree. So this, this gets back to a little bit of my trauma background and the effect of trauma on kids. Mm -hmm. And trauma causes kids to have not a lot of energy, not a lot of focus, um, not a great ability to connect with adults or peers. Mm -hmm. So the fuel that you want kids to have to be able to sustain them in doing rigorous work is exactly the thing that they don't have. And they need, they desperately need to get this from mm -hmm. adults. And in at least our um, band of schools, we have adults that really don't look at teaching mm -hmm. as having to do with that. So this was a bit pushing from what I know works mm -hmm. with kids that have had these kinds of experiences and where their brains just shut down um, we started to look at people who were doing this kind of developmental work. Um, by developmental, I mean socially, emotionally, and cognitively. Mm -hmm. And we picked two practices. We picked the work of Spencer Kagan on cooperative learning. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of things that are called cooperative learning, but this, this ability to have four kids engaged with each other, paired each being the other's coach, each being a bit the inspiration, a teacher being able to put kids in these interesting groups where they become a team mm -hmm. and work on projects together. We, we liked it because A, the, the Kagan structures were really easy to teach and they worked really fast. Mm -hmm. So the cooperative learning um, 
dimension of this. The other thing about it is that every kid has to participate. It's 100% classroom participation. Mm -hmm. And with the percentage of ELL kids and the other mm -hmm. issues that we have, you know, you only have a small percentage of kids that typically participate mm -hmm. in class. So cooperative learning was one of the practices that we picked. And the other was the work of Rick Stiggins and the Assessment Institute in California on student-involved assessment. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the choice of those two, they basically are directed at kids developing agency in their own learning, mm -hmm. setting goals, wanting something from their teachers, having a different way to have relationships with peers and adults. Because to me, that's the golden glue mm -hmm. that gets underneath what some of the damage is yeah. from trauma. Yeah. So those four practices now are the core of our, our teacher training. And they're delivered starting in a summer institute mm -hmm. throughout the year. Hmm. Great. Great. So that's the turnaround model. So the turnaround model together. today is student support, teacher practice, and a focus on leadership coaching. And the leadership coaching is very specifically around how to establish mm. the conditions for teaching and learning in a challenging school. Mm. It's, that's our relationship yeah. to the principal and how to use data to do it. Yeah. Now, and you, so you started this now, gosh, was that? 12 years ago. Okay, 12 years ago. And can yeah. you, where are you all now in terms of the scope of your, of your efforts? Well, I, I think two things, two big things are happening. Um, one, I would put under the heading of direct impact and asking the question, just looking at the program work itself, mm -hmm. how big do we have to be? Where should we be? What's the most important thing mm -hmm. that we can do from the perspective of the program? Yeah. And the observation that we have and the one that is driving our strategy is that districts are in the business of student support. They do it, mm -hmm. but they don't do it well. And they're in the business of developing teachers, but they really don't give teachers the full complement of tools that mm -hmm. teachers need. And then when you look at assessment, which also is driven by districts, even if we say that we value the social and emotional and cognitive development of kids, the only thing we measure is test scores. Mm -hmm. So there's something wrong with this picture. And we believe we're the organization to say that a lot of what's going on in the reform effort is great, but there are some things that we have to get real about having to do with, having to do with these challenges. So if you, if you give me the magic wand, my magic wand is to make districts and their architecture mm -hmm. do this work mm -hmm. and make it part of everything they do. See it as a part of doing teaching and learning well. Mm -hmm. And so how many schools has Turnaround operated in to this We've point? We've been in over 70 schools okay. so far. In New York and? We were incubated and grown in New York, mm -hmm. primarily in the Bronx, but now are in other mm -hmm. boroughs as well. And four years ago, we made our first move outside of New York to DC. Mm -hmm. And um, just hot off the press is that we're going to be partnered with Kemi Anderson in Newark. Mm -hmm. um, and in both DC and Newark, it would be district level and school level partnership. Mm -hmm. I think with Kemi Anderson, there's a great excitement to use the district architecture in this way. Yeah. She's a real believer. I think in DC, it, DC is part new, part old, mm -hmm. and so I think they, they're going to have more challenges in getting this yeah. to happen district-wide. And at the school level, like how do you ultimately measure the impact of, of this? And, and what have you seen in, in those schools? Sure. One of the things we felt that we had to be true to in measurement is that we believe in formative measurement because we know that you can't establish these kinds of optimized learning environments in one year. Mm -hmm. And as a CEO of a nonprofit, and you know this, um, everybody wants everything to happen in a year. Yeah. And, and, and then they'll renew your grants. <laughs> and so, and, and so I, I, I'm not saying this honestly in a manipulative way. Um, we know that this takes more time 
and we had to grow in our own credibility to be able to stand up for that mm -hmm. and to be able to say this is what you will see at the end of one year and this is what you will see at the end of two years yeah. predictably. So we measure basically three domains. We measure the efficacy of the student support architecture mm -hmm. and that is how many kids are being seen? Are they being, um, are they improving as a result of it? Um, how does that look from the classroom, from outside the classroom? Um, we look at classroom efficacy using the class rubric, the classroom mm -hmm. assessment scoring <coughs> system, because we're particularly concerned with the teacher-student connection, mm -hmm. and that's the thing that most is touched by mm -hmm. our intervention, so we use class as a measurement of efficacy. And then in terms of, of leadership, we're looking at the measures of school culture mm -hmm. and whether those have improved. So our leading indicators are in the student support culture mm -hmm. classroom efficacy realm. Our summative indicators are academic improvement, mm -hmm. but that can be looked at as percent of kids reading at grade level, not just yeah. state tests. And then the newest thing we're doing is actually measuring three domains of learner attributes. We're measuring a motivational domain, a self-management domain, um, and a social efficacy domain. So, and we're actually doing pre and post surveys of students mm -hmm. because our belief is that a well-developed classroom that is developmentally nurturing mm -hmm. to kids will show effects in kids. Yeah. And that's what we're after. And have you seen a correl? So first, do you have those la the latter set of domains that you just described? Do you have results on those? It's only being or piloted just being this done. year. Mm -hmm. And and are there correlations between so the schools that you're in and you know school improvement on academic indicators? I mean, do you see those correlations? Well, let me let me do this case, as a case study yeah. so that you can sort of see the picture because this is a very typical story. Um, this is a K-8 to school in D.C. that had about 19% of kids proficient mm -hmm. when we started. The principal had been the principal, he is a TFA alum. Mm -hmm. He was um, in the highest performing elementary school in the district. Okay. And I Michelle retapped him yeah. to become the, yeah. uh, the principal of yeah. our school. And he went into that school and within a year was drowning mm -hmm. and second year was drowning. Now we didn't meet him until his third year mm -hmm. and his school is now taking off in big time academic mm -hmm. gains. Mm -hmm. but, but I think the important part of this story is that he reconstituted the staff he himself is a high performer. Mm -hmm. He's a tremendously strong instructional leader. And he drowned in this environment until the environment mm -hmm. got under control. So what he would tell you is if he had us at the beginning, mm -hmm. what took him three years to do, he would have done in a year. Yeah. And he would have gotten the school with optimized conditions for teaching and learning. And then a lot mm -hmm. of the other stuff he did would have showed its value. And that's our typical story. Right. And so, so it seems like this is an enabler in a turner, as you know how, I mean, we, we see so few models of turnaround schools. Like we see high performing charter schools and some high performing schools within the traditional system. But to take the big urban schools and put new management in and give them the authority to even turn over the staff, like still the results. I mean, there, there are right. obviously some successful turnarounds, but they're just very few and far between. That's right. Um, and even when you take the high-performing charter managers and give them one of those schools to experiment with, they're like tearing their hair out a right. year later and saying never again. So it feels like I, I have a, one example of that, <laughs> but I know that there are others. Um, so it seems like this is an enabler, like if you mm -hmm. took a very capable principal who has what it takes to run a high performing school and paired them with your um, approach that I mean is that the theory that this this could in fact hold the key to actually being able to turn around the existing schools yeah I, I, I mean it is I, I think that we haven't focused on this to any degree 
as much as, as has been needed. So instead, we've taken our talented teachers. Mm -hmm. I remember the op-ed that you did where, where what you were concerned with was all of this focus on the teachers will lift these schools. Mm -hmm. And when are we going to understand that, that we can't look at one individual, one role, and say they, they by themselves are somehow going to be able to surmount these challenges. Mm -hmm. So whether you're talking about leaders or teachers, I think you have to establish these enabling conditions. And, and even the best leaders and teachers need to have the tools to do it. Mm -hmm. So I mean, one more question is to follow this up, and then um, we've got lots of good questions here, and okay. I think some out here too. Let me just do my check here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe we'll shift gears for a bit, but I wanted to follow up. So when you say you know we need to measure our success of you know the reform effort in ways broader than than academics, mm -hmm. um, how how do you see that? I mean, in an optimal world, how would we measure our success? Okay, um, one thing that I'd want to share with the larger audience here is a paper that I read last year that really was a huge influence on me. And it was the Chicago Consortium paper on non-cognitive attributes mm -hmm. of kids. And the folks in Chicago synthesized hundreds and hundreds of pieces of research on just those qualities that every one of us needs to be a successful student. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Angela Duckworth and the motivational and grit stuff, yeah. all of that yeah. is in there. But basically what they say in this paper is that there is a set of attributes that are social, emotional, what they're calling non-cognitive, mm -hmm. that yeah. are as important to being a successful student and perhaps even more so if mm -hmm. you have known trauma. Yeah. in order to be able to put the academic pieces together and be successful. That paper, I think, points the way. There is, let me put it this way, in our policy work, there's no meeting I go to today where somebody is not quoting that paper mm -hmm. back to me saying, OK, what would you measure? We need to get a hold of that paper. Okay. Send I'll it send out. it to you. Um, okay. What? But and, and I guess we'll just read it. But but there are things that include only the grit first fifteen and, pages. It's yeah. Okay. okay good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So Very so long. <laughs> let me shift gears. I mean, there's so and and you know, Ting Yu, who, who's the editor of our One Day magazine, which goes to all of our uh, all of the Teach for America alumni. Um, so she says, in the wake of Newtown and other national tragedies, we've discussed gun control, but often lost sight of the mental health component. What would you tell public officials and politicians who are formulating policies to reduce violence and cope with its effects? Uh, okay. One thing that we've covered a lot today in this, in this conversation, and that is that schools have to be able to set up, to be set up to identify children with needs. Um, that child who did the Newtown shooting, the kids, I, I was very involved in the Columbine period, those kids were completely identifiable. Mm -hmm. Okay, they wouldn't have been easy to treat. These are the, exactly the kinds of kids I was talking to you about before that would have eluded help. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have a system at all, and right now we're coming mm -hmm. from so far behind in not having any systems mm -hmm. to correctly identify these kids, let alone have the tools to overcome some of the resistance to being able to get them help. Yeah. So this issue that schools have to have both an approach to prevention, but, but an approach to prevention means that you have to have a way to identify kids and I identify them early. And all of those things are knowable skills, they're yeah. trainable skills, it doesn't mean every teacher has to be a social worker, but you have yeah. to be able to identify And them. where are we? So, so this is clearly the first piece, I think, of, right. of your model. And is this happening in other places? I mean, where are we in the effort to actually scale that system up? We're not in a good place. <laughs> yeah. We are not in a good place um, for many reasons. I mean, I, I think I get asked all the time, are there other organizations like Turnaround? Mm -hmm. and, and I hate to give this answer, but, but I now know for a fact mm -hmm. that there aren't. There aren't organizations mm -hmm. that have integrated across the emotional academic divide mm -hmm. that exists. And, and part of how we have been able to do it is that we have focused our attention tremendously on the mission of schools, which is to educate. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that my covert mission, <laughs> 
okay, that I'm yeah. saying to the world here yeah. is about kids that are socially and emotionally healthy. Yeah. And that that's what schools also have to be able to do. But when I began 12 years ago, it was extremely hard to sell that. Mm -hmm. Okay, it was fine to sell mental health services for some small percentage of kids. But the notion that our schools have to be built to develop kids in this broader way, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there was not a lot of acceptance of that. I feel a tide turning mm -hmm. right now. And it's, it's partly being driven by the challenging aspect of these schools. Mm -hmm. But I think there's also a tremendous amount of research that's starting to happen that says this is just a smarter way to do things mm -hmm. and we should pay attention to what the research is telling us. And, and if you were an alum of Teach for America or any, Come to work for any of the Teach for All programs out there, yeah, who really are like, yes, like we see this issue, we want to take action, we want to use this moment in time too to help people understand this right. has to be a huge effort. I mean, what would you suggest that they do? Okay. Work at turnaround, being yeah. one option. No, actually, um, I, I was saying that because we, we are growing and, um, and we love hiring people from Teach for America, <laughs> so, so I will say that. Yeah. But actually, I really think that the answer is the district. We have got to infiltrate the districts mm -hmm. and we've got to harness the district architecture to do this work. Mm -hmm. there, there are huge sums of money Title I and Title II money that are supposed to level the playing field for kids growing up in poverty. Mm -hmm. Okay, these funds just pass to schools with no accountability associated with it, none. Yeah. And so some districts feel that their Title I money is flexible, other districts feel that it isn't. But, but the advocacy on behalf of changing the way districts do this work yeah. And by this work, I mean develop teachers, which is your core business. Yeah. And, and the other core business of districts is something that they call student support, student engagement, mm -hmm. which has to be built out in a more intentional and deliberate yeah. way. It's, it's actually sort of shocking to think about how much this has not been a part of the discussion. Right. Like I even, I just think about my own kids and and all the families I know and all the kids. And I mean, you know, you have parents in overdrive about getting their kids assessed by every single type of possible professional, <laughs> I will admit to doing it myself. And, you know, we've got kids who are fully diagnosed and fully, you know, I don't know, cared for. And it's just like the, the know-how and the kind of resources that goes into that, which is so inaccessible in the communities in which we're working, and I take well, it we have bet on a social worker system, but, but one social worker for all these schools, for all these kids in a single school is just not. Well, working. and I think we have approached it with that kind of, if we put a social worker there, we will have fixed this. If we put something called wraparound services there, mm -hmm. we will have fixed this. And our reason to be is much more about we need a different design mm -hmm. for schools. One of the things that um, is not something that is your direct question, but, but I think it's, it's very significantly mm -hmm. inside your question. You're talking about the fact that in middle class and upper middle class communities, there is a support system around kids and families that ensures the fact that if they present with needs beyond the bounds of what a teacher can do, they're going to get it. Yeah. And we're saying here amongst ourselves that we know that in poor communities, they aren't going to get it. The, the communities are under-resourced and the schools are under-resourced. Mm -hmm. So there is a different all-hands-on-deck skill-based approach that is what Turnaround speaks to. It's about the proficiency of every adult <coughs> in the building. We're saying that no, a social worker is not going to fix this. Mm -hmm. No, a mental health clinic is not going to fix this. But if you do think of 100% of adults in a building armed specifically with a set of tools to drive social and emotional and cognitive development in kids, mm -hmm. and you say, could that be the lift that we're looking for, then I think you begin to open up something that could work. Yeah. The, the second terrifying thing is the common core. Because the com just as you're saying there's this inequity of service and resource mm -hmm. around high poverty schools. When we think 
a turnaround of the Common Core hitting our schools, mm -hmm. it will just basically cleave off 40% of the schools in this country with teachers that can't go from where they are that are going to be seeing kids more and more frustrated mm -hmm. as they try to do the challenging work of the Common Core from where they are right yeah. now. Yeah. And so the Common Core is another thing where the inequities that exist could be magnified. Mm -hmm. um, Laura McSorley, who's Teach for America's um, <coughs> head of early childhood, mm -hmm. um, says you're building such a comprehensive system. What advice would you give to Teach for America in, in helping build this kind of support? Meaning, like, can we, so we've got all these teachers out there in schools and alumni, like the ones who are well, actually here, teaching. I'll tell you what I would do. Yeah. I mean, Kate and I were talking about this as we were walking over here. We were imagining a world where every single teacher who works in a high poverty school had exactly the tools, not a hundred tools. Mm -hmm. We're advocating for four tools. Okay, four tools at a high level of proficiency in every teacher in America. Yeah. Okay, tools that could drive the social and emotional and academic development of kids. If, if we did that, and, it, and TFA has this very big megaphone to say that the toolkit of teachers needs to be broader than what we thought. Mm -hmm. That content and delivery of content and all of that to high standards, high expectations, all important. Yeah. But we need something else. And, and when you think about those four tools or approaches, how long, like, what are we talking about practically? Like, if you were to train teachers fully in those, how, how, long, how, how, does, how long does that take? Two to three years. Yeah. That's what we're saying. But we see a lot, even in the first year. Yeah. Some of them are easier uptake than others. Um, the cooperative learning structures are really fast, mm -hmm. but they look really, really gorgeous the second year. So. And, and given your experience in other countries, um, do you think it's, I mean, how, how applicable is this to, I don't know, very different contexts from India to Pakistan to, you know, Peru and Chile? Well, the only countries that we've ever worked in, um, and this was before Turnaround was ever founded, was with Open Society Institute in Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. And the model that we used then was that each country would develop an NGO devoted to this. Mm -hmm. and, and I could imagine something like this. It'll happen yeah. in my next lifetime, but, <laughs> but I could imagine there being an, I mean, our NGOs were focused on emotional development of kids. Mm -hmm. And that's what we were teaching and we yeah. taught it to 18 countries. But what if the NGO instead was about teacher development? Mm -hmm. What if it was about teacher and leader development? Yeah. And each country had an NGO that... So you, 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 you never know. I mean, we have <laughs> KIPP-inspired schools starting up now all over the world in the hands of these Teach for All network partner alums. I'm so okay. now we'll have turnarounds. <laughs> <laughs> they will be at your doorstep begging you for help before you know it. Um, seriously. We'd welcome really that. Might. We'd um, welcome. Let's see. This is from Georgia Gillette, who's the head of communications for Teach for All. Um, how can teachers reach out to parents to promote their engagement education around mental health issues? You described some of these schools as a war zone. How is Turnaround's model applicable in global contexts that are war-torn or struggling with endemic violence? We were exposed a little bit to this, uh, even as far back as the Eastern European project. But, <clears throat> but I think what's more relevant is just what we see in the South Bronx. Um, parents are never invited to school for any good reason. Okay, in, in our type of school, no parent is asked to come to school because their child's being celebrated. They're always asked to come to school because their child's causing a problem. And they're invited in to discuss the problem. So our experience has been, A, that if the culture of the school changes in a positive way, parents just start to migrate toward the school because the expectations feel different. But if a school intentionally goes about not blaming parents, and inviting them in for positive things, mm -hmm. 
And sometimes that has to start with home visits. It has to start with a really intentional kind of outreach. Mm -hmm. We have found one organization um, that we're working with in DC. I've never met another one like this. It's called Flamboyant. Mm -hmm. And they do the most incredible outreach to families to make them feel that schools are a safe place for them to come to. They're much better mm -hmm. than us. Yeah. Um, but I think that the body of knowledge about how to do this is, is starting to expand. Mm -hmm. But it really has a lot to do with being sensitive to this idea that a parent is expecting blame. Yeah. And you have to change that, that mm -hmm. expectation. Mm -hmm. um, feel free to ask questions. Um, I'm curious what your reaction to the controversy around the gun violence situation is. I mean, what, what's your reaction to all this? Well, the thing that worries me about the gun violence argument is a little bit like what you and I experienced five, six, seven years ago in education reform. In, in those early years, there's such a drive to say what's the one thing that we have to do. Mm -hmm. And so at one point it was accountability. We've got to measure. Mm -hmm. Another point is the teacher. Every classroom's got to have a great teacher. And it makes people feel as if their job is done when they figured out the one thing. Mm -hmm. The profession I come from in medicine, you never think about just the one thing because you know you could get nailed mm -hmm. if you miss something. Yeah. So you look at it the other way and you say, what are the top five things that I should be worried about here? And I'm hearing that there's a tremendous focus on controlling access to guns, which is not yeah. arguable, and I would never argue with that. But, but I think there's a number two, number three, number mm -hmm. four around culture of violence issues and why that exists mm -hmm. and how to, how to put some container on yeah. that. The mental health piece for sure. There's been a lack of parity around especially child mental mm -hmm. health uh, supports for years. Mm -hmm. Then there, there, there is also the politics that close psychiatric hospitals. I mean, this is part of my former life but what did we think was going to happen when we closed all of those hospitals? Where did mm -hmm. we think these people were going to go? Yeah. And, and a lot of the, the violence that you're talking about in terms of who's buying those guns, mm -hmm. you're talking about people that... So, so I think I would like to hear somebody say, here are the five things I'm going to do to get underneath this problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. so far. Um, I had two quick questions for you. Um, one in terms of the of ch children having trauma, like I myself um, was fairly obviously gay at a young age and I was bullied enormously. And so when you think about turning around these schools, is, it, is there like a bullying issue? Is it children that are traumatized by gun violence just in their area? Is it all of those things? Um, and then the other one in terms of mental health care for children, um, there's been a lot of worrying reports lately about how many children are on psychoactive, psychotropic drugs for ADHD. I mean, even kids being given, you know, who are not psychotic, being given antipsychotics. And so do you advocate a particular kind of mental health engagement, like a cognitive behavioral? I mean, obviously, pharmaceuticals are warranted in some cases, but it seems like we're going to them too fast with kids today. Um, so just curious where the trauma is coming from and what do you advocate? Okay. Well, the, the two subjects that you brought up actually argue for an and, not an or. Okay, the, the, the question of bullying and then the question of a violent culture in a school um, argues for a preventive approach. And a preventive approach means a school-wide culture with a set of expectations and norms that every adult and child in the school lives and models. What we have in our schools is a whole lot of expectation for kids, but adults who don't necessarily model those kinds of practices. So 
one thing that, that I think wraps around your first point is that we know how, not we turn around, we the country know actually how to establish a supportive and safe culture in a school with the intentional teaching of social and emotional skills to adults and kids. This is known, okay? The practices are out there, the research has been done on it, and we don't do it, okay? We don't do it, we don't scale it, we don't commit to it as a necessity, meaning it's nice if school A over here has it, but the idea that you drive through a country the notion that every school should be safe, emotionally and physically safe for kids. You know, how can you argue that? Okay, so if that existed, then you would have been in that, in that kind of culture. Now, could you have been bullied? Yes. But then the next layer would have been, would there have been someone to talk to in that school about that? So then you get into the thing that becomes interventional with trusted teacher, social worker, counselor. I think all of these levels have to be in a school for it to be a truly complete environment. The second question you asked is on the other side. It's the interventional question. And this is, this is a very controversial um, question. I feel tempted to be my most controversial oh, yes. right now. Yes. Okay? <laughs> I, I don't know why I'm feeling so disinhibited. It won't. This is, this is a safe space. Okay. Yeah. Um, if I told you that 82% of kids that are incarcerated today have an undiagnosed learning or attentional problem, okay, so I want to know whether you would put those children on medicine in the kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, if those attentional issues and um, disruptive issues were apparent, or would you put them in therapy? And then if you couldn't get them into therapy because their parents wouldn't allow it, what would you do? So my controversial statement is that we are sending so many kids to jail, okay, whose issues began very, very early. Yeah. This is the biggest growth industry in this country, or prisons. So to me, if we had to medicate large numbers of kids who come to school with attachment issues, trauma issues that make them highly distractible and impulsive, which is one of the things that trauma does to kids, would I use medicine to get them engaged in school, then taper off the medicine when we have kids that are able to be connected to an educational environment? I probably would do that. But I think right now, there is a misuse of medicine going on, okay, by which I mean medicine being prescribed not thoughtfully, okay, for symptom control. <coughs> and I think that's a bad thing. So if, if it were take a magic wand and paint it over a system that could run the way I'd suggest, I think there is a proper use for medicine early, but it's really got to be guided by a correct assessment and proper follow-up. Is just it just a matter of well-trained medical professionals? I mean, is it, or is it, like, wh why does it go wrong? Like, why do things go undiagnosed versus, and why are some things overdiagnosed or wrongly diagnosed? Just, just, is it just, it's just the mental health system, I guess. Um, actually, a lot of the why it goes wrong is a combination of parent and school pressure. It's, it's actually not being driven mm -hmm. by the profession. The, the fault that could be laid at the feet of the profession is they're going along with it. Mm -hmm. And they're not, in other words, they're being... So meaning some parents don't want their kids on medicine and some really do, no matter many what. Many do. Many, many do. And, and I think there is also a tremendous amount of pressure coming from schools mm -hmm. to advocate for the use of medicine because that will make mm -hmm. classrooms yeah. um, more controllable. So I, I think there are lapses in discipline in all three, in yeah. all three places. It looks like we've only got a couple minutes left. Okay, but sorry. Um, <laughs> one more question from Ben Schumacher. Um, are the, 
which is, is just, are the services and supports you're describing, like in, in the high performing, I mean, are there systems around the world where they actually do this well for all their students? Or is it just that we have a greater need for this system given that we have more poverty and violence in some of our communities than some countries do? Um, I, if we're talking about the services and supports piece, I don't think that there are countries that do it better than we do it. Mm -hmm. um, I do mm -hmm. think there are countries that do the classroom piece mm -hmm. and the school culture piece better than Which we do. Which countries do that? Well, we, well, one country I'm going to learn about this week is Singapore. Mm. <laughs> um, and, but the interesting thing about Singapore is the reason they're coming to us is because they don't think they do the social and emotional and so service funny. piece. Singapore's with. coming to us too. They really <laughs> want to teach for all program because evidently there's some sliver, actually it's their special need population that See? they want to talk about. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so, and, but I do think that, that there, is, there are a few countries in the world that are as heterogeneous mm -hmm. as, as we are. There are plenty where the trauma factor is, yeah. is as high or higher mm. for sure. Thank you so much. This has been great, just really helpful. Thank so, you for thank inviting you. me. Thank yeah. you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.